So again, a history lesson, why your parents told you to pay attention to history. There's a standard that I'll talk about today called XBRL, Extensible Business Reporting Language, and it's very similar to another standard, HTML. So I worked in Silicon Valley in the late 90s with a bunch of software and internet companies when the internet was just taking off. And HTML was a language that was very, very hot then because it's the language that drove the internet. HTML is the language of the internet. So in, in 1996, here is the conversation in my firm, and I would beg to say in many companies in 1996, it went something like this. Nick, you, you, you think we should use HTML to link documents, is that right? Well, we, we have uh, Lotus Notes. We can already link documents. We don't need HTML. Why do you think we need it? So, so we can have a website? <laughs> I just told you, we have the largest Lotus Notes network in the world. Why would we need a website? Oh, do you think people are gonna buy things over the internet? Okay, I got it, I got it. Right, that's gonna happen, okay? That was a discussion in 1996 with HTML. Now we look back on it and you laugh, but in 1996, people with that perspective were earnest in their beliefs. They were very earnest in their beliefs. And to me, it was simply because they didn't understand the simple concept of standardization. So if we look at the differences here, HTML was developed by the W3C, XBRL has been developed by the XBRL Consortium. It's an international consortium, 700 plus organizations from all over the world. HTML is about linking documents. XBRL is about tagging financial statements. That's not the case at all, but that was people's perspective. It's technology looking for a problem. Not the case at all. It was designed to solve common business problems. We have a single instance. Why do I need this? We can outsource this. It's not going to be relevant to us. This is just about tagging external reports. It doesn't apply to me. I'm an IMA member. Well, I'll do this when somebody makes me do it. So these are all examples of misperceptions of a standard that's transforming how processes work. So I want you to think about the person who thought, hey, I don't need that stinking HTML, I've got Lotus Notes. Today, their perspective is, is our website down? You're kidding me. You know, they are so focused on the web in terms of how they're communicating and selling products that the idea that they wouldn't be using it is a joke. So back then, we had one person in our firm who had access to the internet. That was called the webmaster. Because the internet wasn't relevant to our professionals, it was just relevant to people that wanted to look at our website, whoever that might be. That was the thinking, okay? So very common ideas, but very common perceptions initially. So this is the most technical slide I'm gonna show you, and this is what XBRL standardizes. So you have a simple concept, let's say it's cash, and I can standardize the description of it. Is it US dollars, is it actual, is it budgeted? You, you know, what's the nature of the information? You can also standardize formulas and calculations. In other words, total assets is actually a formula in addition to being an amount, okay? I'm gonna come back to that concept in a minute. The label concept is basically a, a, a concept that says what are we talking about? The presentation is simply what you see next to the amount, okay? Now, everybody can read the presentation here, yes? All right, what if that presentation was in Mandarin, or French, or German? Could you read it then? Maybe not. So envision a world in which I can look at a report that was prepared by someone in Germany or China in their native language, and the presentation concept allows me to look at that in English, or French, or German, in my native language. So the Korean Stock Exchange, five years ago, they need capital to grow a very high-tech business. You know, their economy is based on technology. But people don't read Korean, typically outside of Korea. And so all their reports are produced in Korean. Well, they used XBRL and this idea of the presentation to allow the Korean companies to produce in Korean and consumers to read the information in a language of their choosing, English, 
Japanese, Spanish, German, and French. They did a pilot of the top 20 companies, and what they found was in the three weeks following when they published that information, that the percentage of international investment in those 20 companies doubled. They went from the, the mid-teens into the high 20s because it allowed people to see the information and to understand it. The simple concept of language, real language, and this is an example of what XPRL standardizes. So if you have a multinational where you have a chart of accounts, my guess is that it's in English. But if you have people overseas, you're expecting them to read English. This concept would allow them to publish it and to see it in a language that they're familiar with, even though the concept is the same, cash. Definitions is a concept of defining the concept, whatever that might be. Cash and cash equivalents, petty cash, fixed assets, don't care. The reference is a way to connect the element, whatever it is, to something you find relevant. So um, one I'll use here is deferred income tax assets. So in the old school, there was a FASB standard or related to that in a paragraph. Okay, now, do you know which paragraph that was? Right, okay. I remember because I got gray hair and I dealt with a lot. It was FAS 109, like paragraph 43, 44, something like that. I have that in my head. I'm just like that woman who was standing at the cash register, right? But the students, the young people, they may not know that. They don't have it in their head. But in XBRL, they have it at their fingertips because they can look at those elements and for the US GAAP XBRL idea, it actually has references to all the FASB standards and to all the SEC regulations. So you can look at any disclosure concept and it relates directly to the FASB concepts and the SEC concepts. You could also use it in your company to relate to policies, controls, subject matter experts, anything you thought was relevant. Let me go back to formulas for a second. Um, does anybody here use YouTube? Anybody use YouTube? Okay. Uh, use iTunes? Okay. Perfect. So what you do on YouTube is you share videos, right? And you can take a video and you can mash them up, you can make combined videos, right? So um, I have a couple of daughters and um, they play sports and so I'm trying to get them recruited and so I put a lot of videos up on YouTube for college coaches to look at. And that's great because they can pull them down and look at them. But I'd also like to be able to share some of the intellectual property I have around formulas, models. So let me share a formula with you and this you want to write this down, here it is. This is a very key formula. It's B2 divided by F2. Right? Everybody got that? Is that useful to anybody here? Why is it not useful to you? You have no idea what B2 and F2 are, right? But think about your Excel worksheets. All the formulas in those Excel worksheets are written like that, right? Well, what if they were standardized? What if B2 divided by F2 was current assets divided by current liabilities? Now you know I'm talking about current ratio. We all get it. What if I could take that concept, put it in a YouTube library, and you could pull it down and reuse it? What if I took a bunch of those, put them into a pile, called them a model, and put that on a YouTube library and you could pull it down and reuse it? What if intellectual property like modeling was reusable? So that sounds pretty cool, but that's a George Jetson kind of idea. It's gonna happen sometime in the future, right? So how long in the future do you think that's gonna occur? Well, this is a straight punch here. Morgan Stanley did this six years ago with a product they use internally called Modelware. And the reason they did it is because prior to that, all of their formulas were embedded in Excel worksheets that literally walked out the door every night. And so when an analyst left, all that knowledge about B2 and F2 went with them and the new analyst had to pick it up. We at PwC did the same thing six years ago with a platform we use internally called IDP. And so here's the class thing I'll give to the students. Guys, how long would it take you to go out and get the information for 10 companies, let's say in the grocery store sector, I'd like you to build a liquidity model, and I need a PowerPoint deck that shows me roughly 30 slides 
graphs, how long would that take you to do? Forever. Forever. That's like that gazillion on that commercial. Okay, so you're, you're thinking weeks, right, or months? Okay, so this is where I do a demo of the product we have internally. I'd go to the YouTube library, I'd pull down that model, and I'd hit the data refresh button. And it would take roughly 35 seconds for that data to be sucked into my model and for all those analytics to run. 30 seconds compared to the forever. That's the power of standardizing formulas and calculations, is that intellectual property becomes highly reusable and collaborative, social, just like YouTube, just like Wikipedia. And these platforms are out there today for you to use on the internet. Some of them are free and some of them are commercial, but we're talking about social analytics, a Facebook kind of idea. Now, for those of you who are internal to your companies, Here's the real kicker. When you install a piece of software, you have to incur implementation cost, training cost, marketing cost. You've got to convince people that what you want them to use is a good idea for them. So when we at PwC deployed this platform, here's, here's our deployment plan, okay? We sent an e email to our top 10 analysts. That was it. That's all we did. There was no marketing. There was no email from the grand poobah. There was no training. There was nothing. There was an email to 10 people, effectively on January 1. On December 31st of that year, we had 65,000 users of that platform. Okay? It was a Facebook type event in which the collaborative nature of human beings, they realized it was collaborative. They realized, hey, if I train Johnny or Sally, then they can do stuff that I can reuse. So it's just like a Facebook idea. People trained each other, and within 12 months, we had 65,000 users, literally with zero deployment cost. So the power of standardization is not only in the cost of implementation and reuse, it's in how your people work with each other. They work together today, they just do it manually. Standardization like this allows them to collaborate and do it socially like they're currently doing manually. So these are some of the things that XBRL standardizes. How they can be used is almost an infinitely um, amount of uh, uses. We have an academic competition in the XBRL community, and I, I'm a judge on that. And every year we get these projects from these students all over the world. And I've been in this space for a long time, and every year when I get the student projects, my forehead hurts. Because I'm going, how did they think of that? How did they think of that? It is amazing the number of applications these concepts enable in the marketplace. And I'm going to show you a couple of those in a minute. Now, this is a very stupidly simple process, the dimming wheel. OK, these are recurring processes that you have in reporting. You collect the information, you validate it, you analyze it, you report on it. OK, so that's the basic idea. So this is something that you do all the time every day. All right, here's a supply chain. Over there you have producers. These are producers over here, and it goes through the supply chain, and over here you have consumers, right? Well, you also have consumers over here in this part of the supply chain. If you're in internal operations, you're consuming information all the time, okay? It's not just the analyst or the, the SEC that's consuming information. Inside of a company is consuming information. So in XBRL, there's two basic concepts. One is around external reporting, and the other one is around ledgers. So for those of you who came to this expecting me to talk about the SEC, I would say that the biggest bang of XBRL is in this space of the supply chain. Okay? A company like Fujitsu, $65 billion multinational, they have 157 ERP systems. Okay, we're talking a pig's breakfast in terms of the diversity associated with their infrastructure. Five years ago, they standardized those 157 ERP systems using XBRL Global Ledger. They reduced their IT maintenance costs by 25%, roughly $200 million. All right, that's the power of standardization. And that's a big company. So Mike, I'm not a big company, I'm a small company. Okay, so you've given me some examples. You talked about Microsoft and Fujitsu. Give me an example of a small company, okay? 
the Maryland Institute of CPAs. They used QuickBooks. They had a college intern did the same thing using XPRL Global Ledger, a guy named Tom Hood. So you want to write that down, go out on the internet. He's got speeches on YouTube. He's got PowerPoints. He explains it all. Change the way the, the Maryland Institute of CPAs works. Their accountants can pull information out of QuickBooks into Excel like that. They can design their own reports like that. They're not held hostage by the software any longer. They control reporting, and they can get whatever they need very quickly, very efficiently, just from QuickBooks. That's an example of a small company. My point here is that these processes of collecting, analyzing, and reporting, they occur in a repeated fashion all along the supply chain. So the example I just gave you of Morgan Stanley, which occurs here, those same processes are relevant to you here, just like they are at Fujitsu and at the Maryland Institute. So what if, what if I can look at a system like that and understand it, which you do. But what about this one or this one? What if I could look at all those systems through my XPRL goggles and they all look the same to me? And I could consume those in a very efficient fashion by pulling the information out of those systems directly into my processes, directly into my reports, whether those reports are in Excel or anything else. So here is the case study that's on the internet. What if you could sit in Excel and query Oracle, SAP, Edgar, I don't care, with a Google query? So I want you to think about how you query your ERP systems today. We talked about this earlier. You do it by getting an IT person to write the query for you. What language do they use? What language do you use to query ERP systems? SQL. Use SQL. Now, how many people here can write a query in SQL? OK, some of you can do that, probably 10%. Well, how many of you can speak English? All right? That's the difference. I can sit and I can write a, when I say Google query, I'm talking about, you know, how many widgets do I have? Question mark. I can get the answer. That's the kind of difference we're talking about. I no longer need to know how to write SQL queries. Any accountant can write the query because I can write it in English. That's the difference. So envision a world in which I can sit in Excel and tell Excel, here's what I want. You hit the data refresh button, and just like your browser, it sucks up that data. So I'll refer to that as the Dyson version of Excel. You know, Dyson, the vacuum cleaner guy? That's what we're talking about. That's what we're talking about. That Excel becomes a data browser. And I use Excel because it's the accountant's hammer. It's the accountant's hammer. I'm full of analogies, as you can tell, and probably lots of other things. But about 12 years ago, my wife and I, we built a house, and uh, we live in it today. And um, I went there to watch the, uh, the guys working on the house, and there was a bunch of professional carpenters, right? Now, they all had the, the carpenter's hammer with them, right? The accountant's hammer. It was hanging on their leg. What did they have in their hand? A nail gun. A nail gun. Why? because it was quicker, cheaper, and faster than the hammer. And so when I say the Dyson version of Excel, that's the accountant's version of the nail gun. It's quicker, it's cheaper, it's faster, because it allows you to automate and streamline what you've been doing manually. So let's talk about streamlining your last mile processes. So what is it you see here? People loading something, yeah? Same thing? What do you not see? Standardized containers, that's right. That's right, you don't see standardized containers. So the standard was a giant metal box. 1960s, this was a revolutionary idea. 
Okay? Change the way things work. You've, you've read the case study probably a thousand times. There was a student, Fred Smith. You know, we had the, the, the paper, the master's paper, on an idea of, you know, standardizing logistics. And he got a C on it. The professor told him it never worked. And, of course, that was FedEx. Right? <laughs> but it had to do with how logistics worked. And prior to big metal boxes, it looked like this. So what I am showing you right here, let me back up, this one, what I am showing you here in your context, these are accountants loading and unloading Excel worksheets. Okay? This is the manual effort of loading and unloading accounting worksheets. And the student right here said it would take him forever to load a ship like this because he's doing it manually. So again, here's the, here's the history lesson. When big metal boxes came into existence 30 or 40 years ago, Antwerp and New York City were the, tied for the third largest ports in the world. Okay, both of them were tied. Well, over the last 30 or 40 years, Antwerp moved the port facility from the inner city out to the North Sea and they embraced containerization. They built state-of-the-art cranes, they trained their people, they, they did all the right things. And today, Antwerp is the third largest port in the world. It's the gateway to Europe in terms of shipping because they embraced containerization. New York City had a longshoremen's union, right? They convinced the city of New York to build a state-of-the-art longshoremen's pier, right? because they didn't like those stinking containers. So does anybody know the name of the state-of-the-art Longshoreman's Pier? Chelsea's Pier. It's an amusement park. Okay? You can play golf, you can play tennis, you can see movies. That's what it is today. Okay? In the city of New York, there are no, zero, no shipping facilities at all. They don't do shipping anymore. They went from third in the world to zero in the last 40 years. Okay? Now, across the river in New Jersey, they have a big containerized shipping facility, but the city of New York doesn't have one anymore. And it was because the longshoremen rejected the idea of containerizations and convinced them to spend $40 million on what's now an amusement park. So continuing with how it's relevant to you, Here's the question I have for you. This is a very simple question. What software application is more, most commonly used for reporting? So when I ask this question of my partners, they either answer three, four, or five. That's what my partners think, because we get paid to implement those systems. So that's how they think, right? What, of course, is the right answer? Seven. Seven, absolutely. Absolutely. I was talking to one of our customers, who I won't name, but they were explaining to me that they have all their data in a single instance of software. Okay? And I said, well, that's great, but what do you use for reporting? How does, who prepares your, your annual report? They said, well, Johnny does. I said, well, what is Johnny? How does he get the data from the big warehouse into the 10K? He says, oh, he types it in. OK, got it, got it. This happened to be a very large technology company, so the irony was very you know, thick. 